Thank you, Ben, and hello to everybody. So uh, as Ben said, um, we're looking at the rise of OTT in football. And uh, as Ben also said, it was gonna be my first line. Uh, OTT is not a new uh, thing for most uh, consumers in, in, in lots of types of media, but the, uh, the situation we find ourselves in with COVID around the world means certainly that with fewer people able to access stadiums, that's accelerated the, the need for football clubs and leagues and federations to look at this as a potential um, alternate or additional way of approaching their broadcast and their and their connection with their fans. Um, I mean, uh, at Seven League, we have we have clients who are outside of football in other tier two and, and, and tier three sports, where I think the impact of, of broadcast deals either ending or never having had one and looking at OTT as, as a substitute for that is probably more drastic than it is for, for soccer. So soccer benefits from being still a tier one sport and still can command certain uh, good fees from, from broadcast. But uh, certainly um, entering the, the OTT arena direct is, is, is not a low risk, um, not a low risk uh, operation for anybody. So I think one of the, the, the themes that we'll look at through the course of this panel, and we've got three um, three good panellists with different specialisms um, is that we will consider, well, if you were a, a club or a league a federation looking at getting into this area, what are some of the things that you need to consider that you maybe uh, might, might, might not be aware of? Um, it's very easy for people to sit around and talk about the, the Netflix of football or if the Premier League could just go direct to fan and solve all its problems uh, immediately. Personally, when I've looked at that, I don't think the numbers stack up for doing that. Um, uh, I have been called a know-nothing consultant for, for, for saying that, however, so, um, so, so we'll see. Um, but I am going to turn first to, uh, to Didac from, from SC, SC Barcelona, and I think um, I'll, I'd like Didac to talk, uh, tell us a little bit first about Barcelona's kind of two-pronged approach to, to, to OTT that they've taken with fans, um, and how, how that kind of combines the opportunities both on their own channels and, uh, and with third-party platforms as well. Sure. Thank you very much, Dan. Um, Barca uh, enjoys a privileged position in digital. Uh, we have more than 360 million followers uh, in all our social media channels. That's why we designed a digital strategy some years ago that it has uh, three steps. The first one is to attract all the audience. The second is to capture the data. And the third is to monetize. The third party platforms help us uh, to attract uh, the audience. Uh, we go where we, uh, our uh, audience is, and nowadays our audience is on YouTube, um, uh, Twitter, uh, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, wherever. And uh, for us, it's very important to create those content to uh, hook, to have a hook with them and then once that we we are able to engage with uh, that audience the second step is through our own platform our uh, crm that we call it frm we collect all the data as possible uh, with uh, of our fans so we can uh, develop a deeper relationship and understand um, better about uh, what are the taste and the preference of our fans so we can deliver the a tailored experience and the third step is to monetize by and we monetize in several ways uh, but uh, probably the most popular one nowadays is through our e-commerce through our ott and um, that, that is something that we are very excited so, Didac, I know with your OTT uh, platform, so the Barca TV Plus platform, that's a, that's a direct subscription um, that, that fans can pay a, a monthly fee to watch uh, a number of uh, a number of different types of content, uh, not live games. But you also have Barca Studios who take a, a different approach, right? And, and the club have invested quite a lot in in putting Barca Studios together to make that content and have it distributed, I'm sure, on your own channels, but also going to third parties, probably the best known one is, is, is you've been to Netflix um, with, with, with a, uh, a documentary. Yeah, uh, to have an OTT is wonderful, but the key of the OTT is the content. So uh, our uh, view is to produce as much content as possible, not only content related with uh, football, uh, 
uh, and we also are producing content uh, Barca themed, but not always related with sports. Uh, we are developing a TV show, uh, fiction movies, uh, non-fiction -fic non movies, documentaries, etc. We think that the content is the key for all this uh, revolution, and uh, our approach is to uh, our approach is more uh, like an entertainment uh, company rather to a sports company. I think some years ago, uh, all the sports clubs uh, moved from sports to entertainment. And now our next step is to uh, try to be as close as possible as a content slash media company. That's why we are producing our own content, premium content, we sold one of our TV shows to Netflix in Latin America, and we were, were very uh, uh, fortunate uh, to be uh, that our content was one of the top three uh, uh, in uh, during the month of April. And uh, even we surpassed uh, TV shows like Money Hest, you know, which is wonderful you know, for us. You know? From the disruption point of view, uh, it's very disruptive that uh, Sports club develop a content, sell it to Netflix, and to be on the top three uh, in audience. Yeah, indeed, and I think that one of the uh, one of the most interesting things about that is that if if FC Barcelona, who are arguably the biggest brand in in, in global football, if you're looking at this and your strategy is saying, well, uh, for sure we can have our direct product, but we need to go to other places as well. We can't, like at, even with the most powerful football brand in the world we can't bring our entire audience to us. We have to have alternate distribution. Um, and I'd like to hand to, uh, uh, you know, and if, if that's the case for Barcelona, then we, we'd probably say that for almost anyone else, it has to be the case as, as, as well. And I'd hand to Mateus now um, from Fanatis to, to maybe talk us through a little bit about the service that Fanatis offers, but also your, um, uh, your approach, I think that you've described to me previously as, as being a, a, trying to help clubs and rights holders through a transition into OTT rather than a full kind of disruption of going a straight cut from broadcast into, into an OTT model. Yes, so thanks Dan. Fanatis is a sports streaming company focused on connecting fans with the sports content they love. And as such, we see a lot of pain points and challenges in the current model, both on the fan side and on the rights holder side. So for example, for fans, we see that many times fans want to watch content that's simply not available in traditional distribution because there's not enough airspace. Uh, second, many times um, the price, uh, fans don't want to overpay for content they're not watching. And many times sports content is buried underneath a bundle with a high price point and a lot of uh, channels and stuff that's not really of interest. And third, and maybe most importantly for this conversation is the challenge of aggregation. Um, so today we're finding ourselves in a situation where everyone's going direct to consumer. Uh, there's more and more apps, services, subscriptions to pay, and, uh, and fans are finding themselves with 20, 30 apps installed on their phones, and that's something that we believe is not sustainable. When we talk to rights holders, uh, we see that right holders are, are frustrated because they don't have as much data as they would want from their, from their clients, from their end users, from the fans. And they also see a lot of intermediaries in the value chain um, and that, that make them not receive as much revenue as sometimes they think they could. Um, and, and that's where the transition from direct to consumer, from, from traditional to direct to consumer comes in. Uh, it's, it's easy to say, and I'm sure many, many people here have, uh, as, as you were referring at the beginning, uh, easy to say, okay, let's just go direct to consumer and solve all of our, all of our problems, but it's actually not so simple. Um, OTT is growing, but it's still relatively small. Um, and uh, most of the revenues and most of the money is still in traditional distribution and pay TV in working with broadcasters. So in that sense, we think it's really imp important to take a collaborative approach, working with industry stakeholders as rights holders manage their transition into digital, uh, but not uh, do a, a hard kind of disruption. And, and then the way we think about it as fanatics and how we want to help rights holders navigate this, uh, this transition is uh, first, we realize that uh, rights holders don't have necessarily a lot of deep technical expertise, technology, especially direct to consumer technology and live streaming technology, which is even more complicated, uh, is, is not part, <clears throat> sorry, is not part of their core, uh, core business, it's not part of their expertise. Um, so we present ourselves as a technological partner to help rights holders connect with their, uh, with their audiences. 
And second is um, financial risk. Uh, and most sports organizations don't really have the, 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 the ability to invest and take financial risk in experimenting with new distribution technologies and new dis distribution uh, systems. And in that way, we partner with rights holders to help them manage their financial risk, work with traditional broadcasters and, and, and traditional distribution as they gradually move into digital distribution as well, um, aggregating their content into our broader service, uh, which, which also goes to the point of aggregation versus having all these uh, dozens of apps on your phone. Uh, thank you, Mateus. And I think one of the, it's interesting you made the point about data and uh, access to data, for example, because I think that's often held up as being one of the, one of the key advantages of going at your, going at yourself, right? You can build this huge pool of data and not only can you do amazing things with that, but it's huge value to sponsors and, and so on and so on. Um, and the, the, I heard in one of the previous sessions today, someone talked about um, uh, the phrase wasn't it wasn't rivers of cash but it was something something along those lines that you know the money will pour in once you have these things um can you can you give any examples of how if, if uh, someone's working through you as an aggregator as a right and they're a rights holder and you're the aggregator you're able to still deliver some of that data for them so you can give them the distribution and some of the data yes of course and 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 connecting to your point with the rivers of of, of money or rivers of cash it's, uh, we've seen many rice holders kind of do the simple Excel spreadsheet calculation of there's all these people, if all these people will pay uh, this certain amount, this is an amazing business. And, and, and I think most organizations that have tried that out actually find, discover that it's, it's not so simple. And, uh, and it's not, um, it's, it's, yes. So, so it's, there's definitely a lot of challenges uh, to going direct to consumer, especially to going direct to consumer in the best way possible and managing the revenue uh, cannibalization that that generates. Um, so yes, in terms of working with uh, rights holders, for example, uh, we partnered with the uh, Brazilian League um, and uh, we're selected the, the exclusive global distribution partner uh, for all of the Brazil et al, uh, Series A and Series B. And, and we understand that developing a, a sports property internationally is not only about maximizing revenue, which of course is very important, but also uh, managing data and understanding where the content is to be consumed, by whom, um, and, and, and what devices, and, and what, what's the level of engagement, how we can increase that engagement. And in that sense, our collaborative and partnership approach uh, involves working hand in hand with the leagues, with the rights holders, in order to uh, provide them with as much intelligence about their market as possible. Yeah. Okay, uh, and on that on that point, uh, and talking about the Brazilian league, uh, we'll, we'll talk to to one day now who has deep experience of that area as well, and with, with Globo in particular. So um, this, this we'll focus here with Wonderly more on some of the technical considerations uh, in detail of, of what putting a service out um, can mean. You know, live sports streams very different. To, you know, the Netflix of anything. Netflix have it reasonably easy. No, no one's no, they don't really have peak viewership. They don't have live broadcasting. Um, uh, they, so the Netflix of anything in sport is not like Netflix. Um, but with Wonderly can tell us about some of the experience of providing that technical expertise to Globo and tell us a little bit about your, your company and, and some of the challenges you need to think about when you are broadcasting outside of your own region where, where, where you may not be so familiar with the technical infrastructure. Thank you, Dan. Uh, good afternoon from Brazil, from a not so sunny Rio de Janeiro right now. Um, Storm is a company that has 14 years um, uh, working in VOD area, VOD and live TV area. Uh, we moved to streaming about eight years ago. Together with Global, we built the first VOD platform in Brazil. Uh, Telecine, which is a, a movie channel. It's a VOD, so it's very similar to, it was a VOD, it is uh, still, uh, and uh, it was very similar to Netflix. It was a uh, competitor of Netflix in Brazil. But when we moved to live events, it's another different animal, a whole different animal because live events, especially uh, sports events, you have to have a lot, uh, a lot of different things that you don't have on VOD. For instance, you, you, uh, you don't have, you, you, you have to have a, a much more uh, low latency. I, I, I'm trying to not get too nerdy, but please, again. Please, like, this, is a, this is fine, people need to know this. 
So uh, we have to have uh, we have to have a, 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 slow, um, a more low latency that you, you have on VOD. VOD, you 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 need to buffer and you have to do a lot of different. You 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 need to do a lot of different things that uh, live event live event events don't 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 have to do it. So, for instance, you don't you don't want to your neighbor to shout go before you. So you have to have a, a good connection. You have to have a good connection. And Brazil don't have this. It's a very uh, heterogeneous environment. Um, we need to we need to construct. We needed to construct a, a network here with local providers in order to achieve a latency that uh, it's similar to the the pay TV. That's the first thing that we did here. And as we move to 4K, 8K, the problem starts with the compression, the compression algorithm and stuff like that. So we, we, need, to, we need to improvise a lot as Brazilians do to make sure that everyone in Brazil, that is the size of uh, the, the Western Europe, Brazil has the size of Western Europe and not that kind of infrastructure that Europe has in terms of internet. So we need to construct a, a network with the local partners in order to achieve the maximum uh, uh, proficiency in the, in the signal. And, and I think, is the first thing. so one, am, am I right in saying that the, the difference between the satellite broadcast feed and, and, and a 4K um, stream could be up to five minutes or something like that? You, you, yeah, you, uh, in Brazil, we, 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 got, we got a latency of five minutes when we started the testing. But right now it's similar to the, to the, 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 the live event that they broadcast in the satellite. Because we uh, look we, we look up to the stars, we we got some technology from NASA, which is a partner of ours, to do so. It's called Visor. It's a, a stabilization and compression algorithm that NASA provides for the probes in Mars, for instance. And you know. <laughs> It's bad enough to do the in the Amazon. You can imagine uh, streaming from Mars. So uh, we do the same the same uh, technology as the the space probes do in Brazil. Uh, the the second the, the other thing uh, that we have here uh, another problem that we have here is piracy. Uh, most of our piracy comes. Uh, uh, we did a study of that, and most of our piracy uh, streaming comes from streaming, recasting the signal from legit accounts. So we needed to uh, tackle that uh, in order to uh, provide the, 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 the maximum experience because the, uh, the streaming uh, that is pirated uh, takes bandwidth from the legit accounts and this is this is a very huge problem here because it's expensive the the bandwidth is expensive and scarce so we need to provide a secure way to streaming that content and we need to identify the people that was uh, pirating the signal and we achieved that uh, embedding um, a lot uh, different uh, uh, transparent watermarks in the audio and video. So we can uh, transmit the signal uh, and know each one of the, the, the legit accounts that was recasting for pirate streaming. Thank you. And I guess so to summarize, summarize where we're at so far then, if, you, if you're thinking about going down this route yourself, you need to think about potentially multiple distribution options. You need to think about um, how you can make sure you're not narrowing the access to your content. You're actually kind of distributing it as widely as possible. And you need to understand that in different territories, you may need difficult, different technical partners because the technical infrastructure is different in different territories. And you yeah, have, you have, you have local ports. Yeah. Uh, the need for technology is different from a country to another. 
people are used to uh, experience uh, in Europe that they, they don't have in Brazil. Uh, the, the, the experience between the, 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 the soccer team and the, 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 the cheering, the, 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 the supporting uh, uh, people are different from uh, the Europe and Brazil. So the second screen is different here than you got there. The technology is different. The, the challenge to access the content is different from a country to another. Latin America has some perks that uh, yeah. from Argentina and Brazil, it's quite a different thing. Um, so, well, sorry, sorry to cut you short slightly. I'm very mindful of the clock I can see ticking down in the in, in the bottom corner of our screen. And for the last uh, for the last three minutes, I'd like to bring kind of everybody back in together uh, a little bit and say, you know, you've got it. This is clearly like a big culture change for any football organisation, league, federation, or club. Uh, and I know, um, you know, you've got to think about: Do you have the right mindset culturally in the club? Do you have the right people? Do you have the right uh, you know, appetite for investment. We've, we've talked about all those things so far. Maybe back to DDAC. I think one of your, maybe one of your kind of key achievements at Barcelona has been to has been to get that culture. Uh, uh, can you can you share with us anything about how you feel you've managed that that culture transformation within the club? Sure. Um, the digital transformation of our club has not been easy. Uh, uh, I've been board member for 10 years. I think when I started, when I was 36, I was the only board member in, the, in La Liga who had uh, Twitter. Just for give you an idea about, the, about uh, from where we start, uh, I think iPhone just got one year uh, for, for them. Uh, so uh, it's been a very complicated process. I think that it's always uh, top uh, down and bottom up uh, process that uh, we had three steps. And uh, the first one was to convince the board that digital is, um, is something strategic for the club. Nowadays it's, it's obvious, but 10 years ago it was not. That's why with, uh, we were very fortunate to start very early. And the way that we, we were able to convince the, our board and our president that digital was not for freaks. Uh, or geeks, it was a strategic stuff, is that the 95% of all our fans come from uh, outside of Barcelona, probably from other countries, and, pro and probably they are going to visit us uh, once per year or once in their lifetime. And the, the, and, and, and the 95% of our fans will engage with us with digital. That's uh, how we can make, uh, expand our market. So we did a lot of work uh, convincing our board. The second step was to hire a digital team that is closer to the startup world rather to the corporate world. Uh, we hunt all our talent from other uh, tech companies, startups, uh, and uh, multicultural uh, uh, talent that uh, was living abroad of Barcelona and we bring them back. Yeah, we have and, 10 seconds for point yeah. two. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, sorry. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. And, yeah, and the last uh, step was to, uh, to have a B2F approach. Uh, we, uh, like, we love to call it B2F. The difference is uh, for us, a fan is different, a slightly different than a customer because there's a feeling, an emotion, and a passion behind it. Uh, yeah. Perfect. Right. We are out of time. Thank you, everybody. Uh, back to Ben and for your final panel session of the day. Uh, thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>